C'est bon Are we good Olga de Madagascar. Ok. Merci. Olga from Madagascar. Merci thank you very much. Sympa. Thank you. That was really nice. I am aware and I know that we have no more CD drive at home, so outside you can buy the CDs, I know you have, and uh, you can, you've got 20, you can twin 20 euros and that uh, supports directly the projects that uh, Olga wants to finance. Okay. As as said, sadly, Gerardo is not here, so I have the honor and sadly for you because um, to speak in the name of uh, Gerardo on our work that we did to trip that we did to Komodo, uh, the first one on the survey on that, and then um, survey in the institution, the Komodo dragon, you find them in Indonesia on mainly on five islands we're going to show you where it is and then you can see here quite well the island of flores which is the biggest island where you can find komodo dragons and to the left you have the forest and you have the national park with the isle uh, the island of komodo and um so that is uh, where you're going to find the dragons uh, with the island of Nuja. We can see where they used to live before and when they are used to be. The issue is mainly on Flores linked to the fact that um, the population is growing there. We've heard the same story in Madagascar. And um, and this is going to create, also creates touristic pressure, and this uh, uh, this is cutting up the migration routes from the animals. So today we have isolated population groups on um, on Rinka, and this might become a problem because of the genetic diversity of the flores uh, the specimens. There is a study that was done on the on Flores, on the Komodo dragon. As you can see, there are 340 wildlife cameras that have been uh, um, installed to trap them together with um, the left. Um, and you have about 1,400 kilometers of uh, coastland that have been explored on in trucks and boat and motorcycles. This was a huge over four years to see how the Komodo dragon habitats was uh, shared on Flores. You can see that there's only there's only um, uh, 85 cameras that has uh, that have uh, recorded uh, um, Komodo dragons, and we can see that. In the southern part of Flores, no Komodo dragon was seen. And on the eastern part, also none were recorded. Also, on the southern coast, it's very cliff, uh, lots of cliffs, so that's not really the habitat the Komodo dragon likes. Uh, so who's doing this work over all these years? This huge work, it's the KS, KSP, the Komodo Survival Program. It is a NGO, um, non-profit, uh, that was created 23 years ago. The idea uh, came from Tim Jessup, an Australian, who was doing um, a study in Australia, and he needed students to help. And that's when he met two students, uh, Denny Purwandana and uh, Ahmad Aryefyandi. And uh, these two young people, they created uh, this foundation, this uh, NGO, Komodo Survival Program. And it's the only one in the world for a such an important animal that has, that is only managed by biologists, by young, by local biologists. There's no European uh, that tells them what to do and how to manage, no US, no Australian. And there is just a scientific control and um, and the fact that we have financial resources, we give a hand. It's really absolutely unique, World well and the ESR, the uh, uh, European Zoo Association, 
uh, mainly those that have come on a drug. They support with 40,000 euros per year um, this program. We've heard it often today, and it becomes more and more interesting. We, not, we don't just do surveys on the commodal drug, and we also speak a lot with the authorities, with the schools, and of course with the villages. And that is something that is extremely important. Also, the trading of the uh, BBKSDA. Uh, these are the rangers and uh, and the um, eco rangers, like the and the um, the guards which we have on these islands in Indonesia. You, they, they are taught how to implement the cameras, how to use them, and how to attract the dragons, and um, how to ensure the follow-up of these animals, and particularly uh, pass the information um, to the KSP, to the Komodo Survival Program. Everything linked to patrols, we do it with them. We, uh, we patrol and we survey, and... Um, a big problem, uh, apart from the loss of uh, environmental biodiversity for these dragons, is the stray dogs, stray dogs that are main the main threat uh, for young Komodo dragons. They're hungry and they and they eat what they can, and they, very often it's young Komodo dragons. Here again, the KSP has uh, set up a, a program of uh, castration and sterilization of stray dogs on these islands. And as I said before, we heard it for Madagascar and we heard Ilaria for Calabria. You need to motivate the local population. They are the ones who, at the end, once we've implemented the, the restoration or the protection species program, it always starts with children. We also need to discuss with the villagers that is extremely important to get them to understand. And here the KSB has done something very smart 10 years ago. They, they implicated the Teachers Training College in Jakarta, where each year they have about 20 students and, um, and they send them to the different villages. And when there is a conflict between, human, uh, between humans and Komodo dragons, this is how you handle this. This is what you need to do. Do this like this. You can improve the situation like this. And this allows to really correct the course on site. And it protects the Komodo dragon at the end. But you learn how to manage it. And it's fantastic they manage to do this on Komodo. And we can't even do that in Switzerland with the wolves. And um, also, at the same time, uh, the villagers can make earn money. There is these small uh, wooden sculptures of Komodo dragons that are being sold to tourists that are done on lo local wood by by local artists, which we are going to start importing and selling them in order to finance local projects. If you're still interested, there is uh, one or two outside on the on the tables. You can buy for 30 Swiss francs. Here you can see. On Flores, there's about hundred, a thousand um, Komodo dragons, and on the national park we went for two thousand. Now we have about three thousand Komodo dragons. Even if big pieces like that, it's possible to do this in a couple of years and to invert the the trend, the downwards trend. The survey of these animals has been done going on for 23 years. Of course, we can't do all islands. We can't do anything, every, uh, anything. So we mentioned on each island, you see the small islands. There's always one valley that has been chosen, always the same. And on each valley, we survey three weeks per valley. On Rinka, that is the, um, the right most, um, uh, you know, uh, this is where we spent the three weeks and we managed to bag about 90 Komodo dragons, which we've been able to measure. And this has been going on for 23 years. They have a chip inserted. When we find non-chipped one, they're youngs, or either they're migrating uh, from the another valley. And this allows us to follow them and to survey. And of course, this creates work. And you need to bring all the material to per, per boat, and this is great. I lost lots of weight, which I, of course, called, got back afterwards. Uh, all the equipment to bring um, on foot. You can see on the map, there's different colors. Every time for two, two days, you have the cameras that are installed in one of these areas, and then they're being um, moved around in order on foot in order to record the other Komodo dragons. So this is how it looks. You have the boxes. 
you have the stick, you have the cameras and the red bags, you have the bait and it's actually dripping, stinking fluid. It's not, it smells really bad. And um, and then, then we, ha we hang up the bait. As you know, the Komo dragons, they have a very sense, a sense, strong sense of smell. They can, seven kilometers, they will always, there will always be a Komodo dragon uh, in the in the trap, and they will have one or two outside. Uh, so it's very quickly to get out of the, of the cage and to get them out. And that's the one we, we grab them by the head and we pull them out. Those who are outside, this we catch them with the lasso. It's, uh, it's not small lizards. Um, it's kind of uh, very intense. Um, you can see it here. Sometimes it's somewhat cruel doing this, but um, it's, um, they're not, um, sometimes we have trouble with uh, Komodo dragons uh, in captivity. I can tell you that these are wild ones, and they, are, they do are not they do not go willingly. Uh, and then we measure them: how long they are, how long the tail is, how long the head, how big the head is. Everything is measured. The number of teeth, how wide they are. The, 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 uh, everything is recorded uh, as well as everything is written down. And this, all this for the past 23 years. And all this to the left, you see the boy who's taking, working down of the animal we've just, to the right, you see the young woman who's following this 23 years. And it's really great because you can really see the evolution of the ones we had chipped previously. And we can see how they evolved, how they grew. We can, we, if the, there's dominant males, if it goes back on the other, if the, if the, um, on some um, islands do we have dominating females, and today we have a very nice uh, follow-up for instance that the common male Commodore dragons after at eight and ten years they are dominant, even not even ten years when they're young, that's when they are at the height of our uh, 25 years and their top form, and then it starts going down. Well, it's the same with Commodore dragons, it's eight, ten years. Um, so here again, everything is checked on site. All these are young biologists or uh, park rangers that power work for Kamal. Here you have a nice female Komodo dragon. She is um, she is uh, guarding her nest. You can see she's fairly uh, undernourished. This is just before the um, this. Um, this is very skinny because it's uh, you can see that because it's just before before um, she lays her eggs and then she's going to squirt, squirt some very strong smelling um, and uh, she, she squirts a very strong smelling liquid into one hole and then she lays her eggs onto the other hole so the predators are not going to go for the for the non-smelling hole but for the hole where, where the eggs are and for the ones where there's no eggs and then we need to walk, and then catching it, uh, it's not, Jérôme, can I start the movie? Let me send the movie if it works. So here it's with lasso, sometimes they come, genetically you need to know, the Komodo drug is absolutely not afraid of humans, we are a toy, even there's four, five, six people, he comes back, and when you see the boy next to him with the, he's got a stinky, but as soon as there's something moving, the reptilian brain immediately comes and tries to grab. And this is, so they are, so if you move too fast, it really, you need to be very careful. So now the lasso, we caught the animal, and then it's uh, very tough, we grab the tail, and he would immediately attack, and then, um, and then we block it against a trunk in order to be able to grab the head without being bitten. So you, you don't hesitate. It's very hard to look at. Let me give you a Komodo dragon. Uh, it's not easy. It takes about a quarter of an hour. And then after a quarter of an hour when you load it, He's already completely forgotten what happens. And he, we might even sometimes come back. They have a very short-term memory. He always comes back in the idea that he's going to eat you. What we've also managed to do with the European Zoo Federation is uh, 
As you've seen, it's miles and miles that these boys need to cover. So we managed to buy a land and a sm build a small house on it where the wardens can live uh, so they don't always need to get back 45 kilometers out of it in the next day to come back. They have their station, they can sleep on site and this um, makes their life easier. On the island of Rinka, you've heard a couple of years ago, they, um, they created the Dino Park, the Dinosaur Park for tourists. It's completely fake. It was um, journalism. It was sold by the media on Rinka. It's very nice because on the round square here, yeah, it's a museum on the history of the Komodo dragon. And it's very easy and very easy for the families to come and visit and to to discover these uh, Komodo dragons, which brings in money. The problem is that now they have 1,000 visitors per day to see the Komodo dragons. That's a lot. And they say, yes, but 1,000 people times $10 per the entry. That's $1,000 per day. And with this, we can pay the rangers. But sadly, we spoke with the authorities on site to say, you need to change the way to working because the rangers are paid per hour. They're paid for a number of visits they do, 500 meters in two. So once you've say, seen the common dragon, you get up a thousand people trekking into the forest. But these, so these people, they want to do as many tourists as possible. So there's not just dragons, there's birds, there's lizards, there's snakes, there's the entire fauna, which we could also show them. But sadly, we don't show them. So we did um, a whole strategic plan for the authorities. Uh, to uh, try to lower it to 500 people per day, say 500 people buy ten dollars. That's always fi only five thousand, uh, five thousand dollars. But we say, but let's do 500 people buy fifty dollars. That is nothing for us tourists. It's a non thing. We pay three thousand dollars to go there on holidays, plus the hotel, plus the cocktails and that. And now we have f from ten to fifty dollars. That's nothing, and we'll have more time, more money for the rangers. Uh, to do less tours, and they can show them far more for the communication on these islands. So I had, uh, I showed these pictures. They love our T-shirts. There's not just Komodo dragons. You know, the islands in themselves are magnificent. There's beautiful beaches. It's very protected in the national park. So this is absolutely patak. If you never go there, this is a beautiful area. Then we went to the Taman Zoo, uh, the Safari Taman Zoo. That they're the ones who are raising far uh, the most of Komodo dragons in captivity. They don't always do it in good, so we work together with them say how it could uh, do it better, how they could improve. Gerardo, here you can see them 4 o'clock in the morning. I get up and he's preparing his PowerPoint. That's him. He never stops. That's why he's sick now and couldn't come. And uh, maybe he's hearing me because this is being recorded. Um, so we explain to the entire staff of the zoo the mistakes they're doing while working with the Kamadan. Uh, here behind you can see the cages. Uh, it's too shade, there's too much shade in these cages, or there's nothing to climb. Komodo dragons, up until the year of three and a half years, they are tree dwellers. So in, in, so in one lizard, we have two, time, two types of, when they're young, they're tree living, uh, 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 and then when they're three, four years old, they, they need to uh, climb, and then they live on the floor. So they have no sun, they have nothing to climb, and then they do not develop any muscles, and you can't let them free. So this is the speech we've presented to them. What was interesting is that now we have um, reintroductions. Um, here we have a colleague that just came back from Bangkok. People, we sell them in a Asian markets, and uh, we have animals that are being seized, and. Uh, they don't send them to zoos. We try with the KSB, these animals that are being seized on the markets, to try to reintroduce them three, four weeks, put them, teach them to hunt again, and then we release them back. Uh, this is the north, uh, in the northeast of Flores in nature. Another example, this is a, um, uh, a um, re-raising of six Komodo dragon that came from the Taman Zoo, and uh, we had this a Asian summit on Flores. And during the summers, um, 
and we asked uh, all the countries to release these Komodo dragons, so they did a, so we left them for a couple of weeks to let them hunt and climb again, and then we, they released them again in this region here, yes, you can see it here, here in this region uh, where you have the cursor, and uh, so here you have Laban Bajo and the airport where people fly out onto the islands, and uh, this center which they built there, uh, they just uh, stamped it out of the, uh, it, it, it costed millions in the middle of the nature, uh, from Laban Bajo to here to the center, they built a highway, a four-lane highway. Um, before you t it took motocross, it took hours to reach. Now it's a four-lane highway, and of the six, um, uh, six of the six couple of dragons, three were run over, and the fourth one was um, was um, killed by dogs. So only two survived somewhere in the forest. So what is very important is all this work that has been done, the growth of the animal, what they eat. Um, to this can now be uh, used for the how they eat uh, in the uh, coupling, for instance, who decides, is it the male? No, and on the Kamala Dragon, it's the lady who decides if she wants to pair herself. So we've measured every day, the morning, uh, lunchtime, uh, temperatures, uh, round ground temperature, air temperature, the light intensity, in order to everything um, bring back in captivity for the animals. It's part of the, um, um, and, um, and then how long they live, we always saying that uh, Komodo dragons live 70 years. No, the majority of Komodo dragons, they are going to live not more than 12, 14 years, not f not much. Then there's, of course, exception, but the average age is 12, 14 years old as of today. Then, if you look at what happens on the ground, we did this also in C2. We have um, installations with heat cameras from the top of the bike that uh, heats the, the body. So it's um, so we have um, uh, so sometimes if the head if the head is um, warm, is, this is the image that we want to see on the animals. We want a completely warmed up body, and it's interesting to know at what degree the Commodore dragon are going to come and digest and when. Uh, so, so here in the zoo, we know that we have a thermometer, and we put that on a, in, a, in, a, in a mouse, and then we can see when, when they're going to digest. Oh, we can see here on the image, we can see uh, the, the, uh, at what temperature they are going to uh, digest, to the ideal digest. It's very interesting to follow because Komodo dragons really try to very, uh, they stick to very clearly the uh, same temperature ranges. The same is what we did on site, where we want to do it also with the animals in captivity in the conservation program, is to take all the measures, the growth, and manage to um, to ensure that it's the same trends and uh, va values in captivity as in the nature. Also, a uh, di dietary database today, most of the Komodo dragons of the conservation program, they are overweight, they're far too big, and now we need to have the courage to not feed them. And uh, you know, as we know, it's once per month, and that's it. So it's hard. But uh, because uh, you almost suffer for them. You can see these poor animals, they're hungry, but that's what they need, and that's how they need to feed well. But if we're afraid to get into the cage because they're really hungry, then we need to find other ways to study them, but you need to be careful. But you need to be careful with the overweight of these, obesity of these animals. We already have lots of data on the sick, different illnesses. I'm not going to produce uh, uh, it's not published, but the food can produce, plays a huge role. Uh, the reproduction cycle of the females in captivity, here again with the veterinarians, we have uh, started each month to do echographies and um, of to see how the ovarian system uh, developed. So we think that next year we'll probably, via the uh, European Zoo Association, that we'll be able to communicate around this. So in 2024, and we're still learning everything new about these animals. 
So here the trainings, how to collect blood, how to do the EKG to protect our veterinarians, because we haven't got too many veterinarians. We put the dragon in a box and then it's done from the outside in order to avoid getting bitten by the dragon. And as I said before, typically you have two species of Komodo dragons. Uh, up until the three, four years they live in the trees and then when and then at four years, they move down to the ground. So the environment is exactly. So if you want to raise Komodo dragons, you really need to anticipate these two life, life spaces. And then in the global management plan, we have a conservation plan of the uh, European, uh, American Zoo Association, the European Zoos in Southeast Asia. There's not too many. And there was something in Australia. Today, the global management would be to combine everything, not just Europe and America, but all, really put all the Komodo dragons that are outside of their natural environment in a database with a program that would be world managed worldwide and not by continent. This is what you are seeing here, and it's being implemented. And then um, there's also animals that are not recorded, particularly in Southeast Asia, about 170 animals in uh, captivity. Now, in November, we went back uh, not to do surveys, not in, na in nature, with the Indonesian uh, authorities, Gerardo managed to ensure that the Indonesian authority asked Gerardo to do representations to the 12 scientific zoos uh, to the 12 Indonesian zoos in order to show them how to do proper Komodo management, because some of them are lagging behind. And then we did a monitoring of 51 Komodo dragons in the, in the two Taman Safari zoos. So there was a, the authorities said, told the zoos, you need to work to these conferences, and it's mandatory that you attend. So same here, it was slightly easier so, uh, to do in one week the monitoring of 51 animals. You need lots of hands. And uh, young uh, biologists, young veterinarian, um, it's really cool working with them. We did uh, all the animals, we measured them. E echography, uh, we did the x-rays, we did the blood samples in order to have the genetics of everything that's in captivity in order to be able to take these animals uh, to better understand the genetics between the Indonesian zoo, especially to have young animals that we can uh, reintroduce on the island of Flores uh, since um, so here again, uh, we had to, to look at, um, take the, um, here Vanessa from the zoo that was managing the echographies. And, uh, and then we have Palasuva in Indonesia. That means that the, there were not enough doors to get out of, in and out to, to manage them in boxes. And the results we have, um, we'll have them next year, and slightly later on we'll be able to communicate a bit more. But I think we went f v far, very far with this program to do something with a really uh, important species of the animal kingdom. Thank you very much. I'm going to converse. We will have some questions for Michel. It was a very interesting topic, indeed. Avez-vous des questions? Oui. Could you explain the, the study of, you, you've mentioned about the street dogs? Is it because they're trying to protect their kids, for example? No, not really. It's, uh, it's not the same story. Uh, it's not about uh, a mother trying to protect the, the, their cubs. No, uh, for reptiles, 
well, they just uh, are learning, they're trying to, to learn. Yes, indeed, they know they have to live on trees, but sometimes they go on the ground and they will see a, a stray dog and they have a big eager, you have to know that, a, a, a 1.7 meter uh, female can uh, attack a, a cow, so they attack dogs and there's no way to protect them from that. Other questions? In your presentation, you've mentioned uh, the difference between longevity uh, in, a, in the wilderness and uh, captive uh, longevity. So what are the reasons for this difference? So we don't have the results for the moment. We don't know if it's the case. But generally, yes, uh, captive uh, animals have uh, a longer lifespan because they just do not have attacks or uh, uh, injuries and so on. We don't have the data for uh, Komodo dragons, but as of now, uh, looking at the situation, it seems that uh, longevity is more or less the same today. Uh, but in the past, uh, the captive dragons uh, would die earlier because we didn't know their needs, we didn't know how to cater to their needs, and uh, uh, there was an issue with the development of uh, uh, female eggs, meaning that they could die qu quite uh, early, um, before five or six years old, uh, we would lose uh, the female uh, dra dragons. So this being recovered now, we are quite good now, but the, nat in the difference between nature and captivity um, is more or less the same. We have a good monitoring, but we don't have the exact uh, study on that. Good afternoon. Uh, to come back to, to, to the stray dogs, uh, are there any uh, natural predators uh, apart from uh, dogs? No. Well, uh, human beings, of course, uh, but also um, birds, uh, birds of prey. Birds of prey. Um, uh, it exists, but it's quite uh, seldom. Um, the most I would say that uh, as of today, uh, drugs are the major issues, but also uh, the, the lizards th themselves, the dragon themselves, they, they attack each other. Another question? Thank you. How many Komodo dragons do you have in captivity and uh, in the wilderness, in the region? So in Asia, we are at around uh, 150 Komodos uh, in zoos, uh, but there are also institutions that are not uh, official or, or formal, so we don't have uh, uh, the exact uh, figure. For uh, Europe, it'd be 83, Australia, 10, and in the US, 80, more or less. And in the wilderness, we would say 300, maybe 3,000 or maybe 4,000 uh, Komodo dragons. Thank you very much. I, I, you do not give me my present, is that 